Good morning. Our reading is from Judges, chapter 17, verses 1 to 13, and it's headed Micah's Idols. Now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I heard you cut utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. Then his mother said, as you would, <laughs> the Lord bless you, my son. <laughs> I had to read that several times to make sure I hadn't read it wrongly. When he returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I solemnly consecrate my, sil my silver to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a cast idol. I will give it back to you. So he returned the silver to his mother and she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to a silversmith who made them into the image and the idol. And they were put in Micah's house. Now this man Micah had a shrine and he made an ephod and some idols and installed one of his sons as his priest. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. A young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, who had been living within the clan of Judah, left that town in search of some other place to stay. On his way, he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. Micah asked him, where are you from? I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, he said, and I'm looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, live with me and be my father and priest and I'll give you 10 shekels of silver a year, your clothes and your food. So the Levite agreed to live with him, and the young man was to him like one of his sons. Then Micah installed the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in his house. And Micah said, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has become my priest. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> we're going to be looking at issues we're going to be looking at today and one of the biggest questions I think we can often find or face as Christians is when is it um, the problem of evil uh, how many people think evil is a bit of a problem <laughs> yeah yeah it has its moments doesn't it um, and, and one of the when it comes to the problem of evil one of the questions we often get as Christians is and if God is so good why does he let stuff bad stuff happen no, and, I, and I think it needs to be said at the outset, this is one of those questions that never really comes with a satisfactory answer. If you think you've got a satisfactory answer for this, I hate to disappoint you. 
Um, because if you're a suffering person, um, really you're not always in a great place to hear an answer, even if it is right. And that's not to say that Christianity doesn't provide any answers to the question of evil. It's just, it's got some pretty compelling reasons. For example, um, Christianity, Christianity tells us that evil is part of the nature of this current world that we live in. This is a spiritually broken world where death is a reality. Um, the Bible also tells us that we live in a world where God has allowed people free will, which is the right to choose right or wrong. Um, so a lot of evil is caused by the selfishness of people. Um, and so those are some of, of, the, of the many um, Chris, uh, reasons or answers that Christianity offers to the question of evil. But as someone who suffered knows, as an accurate as an answer might be to your situation, ultimately it doesn't really take away the pain, does it? Mm. Has anyone been in that place before? Yeah, you know, if you're hurting, you're hurting. And that's why in Romans 12, 15, it tells us to support people who are going through difficult times. To rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. In other words, it's appropriate, there's appropriate times to celebrate, but it's also times when it's appropriate to grieve. There are times when we will lose the odd battle. There are times when things won't always go according to plan. Or we suffer because of the sin of somebody else or ourselves. And this ties in with the um, study on a book of Judges, because in our book of Judges, over the last month as we've been going through it, there have been stories worthy of celebration, where people trust God and God has done great things. But there are also stories where it seems that the power of good has been overcome by the power of evil. And stories like these raise the question, where is God at this time? And why doesn't he deal with this situation? Now, if you remember going back to the beginning of this series of the Book of Judges, for those of you who were there, you might have remembered I said this is a collection of stories that range from good to bad to worse. Yes. And over the last month, we've explored the good, um, particularly in the story of Gideon, um, who apart from the last little hiccup at the end, was a pretty heroic kind of guy. Uh, we've also looked, taken a look at some of the question, uh, characters and, and judges who are perhaps questionably moral. Oh, no, morally questionable at times. Get that right? Um, people like Samson and Jephthah. But today, I'm going to take a swing at some of the worst stories in the book of Judges in chapters 17 to 21. Um, stories where it seems like the power of evil seems to win the day. And we, in, this, in these five chapters, we've got two stories. And they're both, both based around people whose behaviour is all about self-interest. Self-interest to the point where not only do they turn their backs on God, but they actually turn their backs on people who are closest to them. And it's also almost as if these two stories are representative of the, the state of the nation of Israel, of how it's become over this 400-year period that the Judges was written in. This is, where we've kind of, this is where we get to at the end, and it's not pretty. Uh, and the inference at this time is that Israel has become a nation that's abandoned God and is abandoning each other. And um, yeah, ultimately leads in a bloody civil war where the weakest people in society become the victims. Does that sound familiar to anyone? You know, if you look at places today like Ukraine or Syria, Somalia or Yemen, um, plenty of places around, these are the same kinds of stories that we see um, being played all over the world. Um, innocent people suffering but from the evil of others, which is a great way to kick off a sermon, isn't it? You know, it does sound a bit depressing, and um, being completely honest, I actually did consider avoiding these chapters for that specific reason. But over the last couple of weeks, as I began to think about these passages, the more I began to realise that these stories aren't simply about what happens when society turns bad. This is also a bit of an insight into the nature of God, and how God is a God of righteousness and justice. But at the same time, God is someone who's not quick to rush into judgement. And that's, that's a funny tension to kind of to, to struggle with. Um, in Exodus 34, um, verse 6 to 7, and, and this, there's a number of passages like this throughout the Bible and the Old Testament. We read this about God, that he's slow to anger. He's abounding in love and faithfulness. He's maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. And yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And it's that first um, phrase in particular that's really significant in this. God is slow to anger. It's pointing out that because of God's nature, he doesn't always respond to evil in the way we'd prefer him to. Who kind of knows how they'd like things to turn out, you know? <laughs> and God says, well, 
maybe, but that's not how I'm going to play the game. He keeps his own counsel about um, when he brings judgment on evil. And which means uh, sometimes in this fallen world, people have to endure suffering that's unjust. And, and whether we agree with that or not, God works to his own time schedule. Now this brings us back to the stories in Israel in the last chapter of the book of Judges. Because this was a time of injustice where it seemed God had gone quiet. So, so why was this the case? Well, perhaps it has something to do with this refrain that we keep running into in these last five chapters. And we see it in Judges 17, 6, 18, 1, 19, 1, and in 21, 25. We read this. In those days Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. Basically, this is what this is suggesting to us, is the people forgot their allegiance to God and decided to do what was ever, what, whatever they thought was best at the time. They were out for themselves. And what we discover is this attitude becomes a recipe for disaster. And, and so with that scene being set, we're given two stories. And both of these stories are set around um, Levites. And, and this is an important point for us to take note of. Does anyone know what a Levite was? Hands, anyone's going to risk? So I had priest? Yeah, well, actually, technically you're wrong. Ah, so... And the, there was priests in, in, in the, in the, in the um, tribe of Levi, but the priests were the descendants of Aaron. So all Aaron's children were priests. The job of the Levites was to serve the priests. Ah, uh, yeah, so the Le- pre- uh, uh, Levites, I mean, unless you're a priest, a Levite wouldn't go into the temple and do any of that stuff. Um, that, was, that was the job of the priests. The Levites' job was to support and, and support the priests, but also was to teach the law to the rest of the nation of Israel. So in a sense, you could say, to make a rough analogy, and it is a rough analogy, um, the Levites were supposed to operate in their society much in the same way as the church is supposed to operate in today's society. They were supposed to be the the salt and light, if you like. Um, They were were to show what God's kingdom was supposed to look like. That was their job. Um, So so while some some Levites were priests, not all of them were. Yeah, got that? Hmm. Anyway, but what what this story is telling us with these two stories, both of them are Levites, um, it's telling us that the, it's, things have got so bad that even the Levites are going astray. Okay, and so this leads us to the first story, in which we've had read to us. But as, as we heard, it's about a guy called um, Micah, Mika, Micah, I'll call him Micah to this, this, this service. Um, Micah, who steals money from his mum, and he ends up making an idol from his proceeds. Okay, straight off the bat, we're not off to a really good start for a Levite. Um, He creates, he's not a Levite, sorry, Micah's, I don't know who Micah is. But anyway, he creates this shrine to this God, he's created to God, um, and he makes one of his sons a priest. Now, obviously, this is completely opposite to what the Ten Commandments say, isn't it? You know, love the Lord God only and don't make any idols in my my likeness. Um, So, so, but, and as Micah kind kind of works this out as he's going, he thinks, hey, this isn't working. Actually, you know, I'm missing something. What am I missing? I know what I... I need to legitimise my room, legitimise my religion, so God can bless me. I'm missing a Levite, and so of course, sure, it's not long after that young Levite happens to be walking past, and um, Micah, Micah makes him an offer, sacks his son. <laughs> I always feel for the poor son who got sacked. The young Levite becomes the priest, and, and in fact, it says the young Levite becomes like a son to Micah. Poor other son. Um, and, so, and so basically, Micah has just bankrolled his own cult. That's essentially what he's done. So, and, and so he's, he's quite happy. That's the way things were rolling back in the day. Um, but unfortunately for Micah, soon after that, the tribe of Dan arrives. And now that's kind of interesting too, because Dan's, Dan in, in the tribe of Israel, Dan is actually quite famous. Does anyone know why? Is there anything special about Dan? Okay. Well, there were 12 tribes in Israel, right? And of, of those tribes, only one didn't actually take the land that was given to them. Guess which tribe that was? Dan. Dan. Yeah. There was also one tribe who started a cult in the north of Israel. Guess which tribe that was? The tribe of Dan. And right from the beginning. And so, um, yeah, so God had said, basically, this is the land I want you to move into. And they said, well, not so sure, and, and, and move north. And on their way more north, they walk past the tribe of, uh, the, the house of Micah. And they see what Micah's doing, and they think, oh, it's not a silly idea. And so they go to the Levite, young Levite priest, and say, hey, why be a um, priest for a household when you could be a priest for a whole tribe? We can have our very own one. 
And so not only do they take Micah's priest for a good price, they also take all the idols from the shrine as well. And so Micah loses his cult, and the tribe of Dan continues on walking away from God and setting their own little um, um, religion up in the city in the city in north of um, Israel. And even today, um, the tribe of Dan is perceived as the black sheep of Israel. Um, apparently, some Jewish traditions um, even went as far to suggest that the Antichrist would come from the tribe of Dan. I didn't know that. I found that out a couple of weeks ago. Um, not only that, if you go to the book of Revelation, um, in, in chapter 7, where it lists all the tribes of Israel, guess which one's missing? Ooh, spooky, eh? Yeah. That, and that's got nothing to do with today's story. But it, it goes to reinforce the point, though, that when God's people sell out, it's not a good thing. And, and so this Levite, who um, sells out his calling, in a sense, is, is one sign that things are rotten in the state of Israel. But then we move to the second story. And the second story is a little horrific, uh, a little more horrific. It's, it starts off with another Levite. This one's returning from, uh, from his in-laws with his girlfriend. And reading between the lines, it doesn't sound like this is a healthy relationship. And um, anyway, as he's travelling home, the sun's going down, and he had the option to stay in a non-Israelite village for the night, but he decided to press on and carried on to the town of Gibeah in, in Benjamin. And, and as was the tradition back then, once they arrived in the town, they used to sit, they sit down in the city square and waited for someone to offer them a place for the night. Which kind of sounds a bit weird for us, but, um, you know, inviting a random stranger to your house. But in Middle Eastern communities, even today, um, hospitality is such a, um, such, held so incredibly high, it's not an unusual expectation. Um, but for, um, for this Levite, this is where things started going badly. Because as they were waiting, an old man comes to them and says, what are you doing here? You can't be here. Come with me. I've got a safe place for you. And so they go to his place. He takes them home. He feeds them. But then later on the night, there's a knock on the door. And the men of the village of Gibeah are outside. And they say to the old man, we noticed you've got a traveler. Bring him out for us so we can have our way with him. Now, obviously, the Levite's not too happy about this. But instead, he sends his girlfriend out. Yeah, and when the morning comes, tragically, she's found dead. Now, I hope you probably don't need me to paint a picture or tell you this, but this is a terrible picture of what humanity can go like. And it's supposed to be a terrible picture. Um, this is as bad as it gets. It's really similar to the story of Abraham and Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you know that story, um, a similar situation like that, that those, those towns were wiped off the map. And, and even more, if you start to explore this story, you look at all the characters, the Levite, the old man, the townspeople, everyone, there's no heroes here. You know, everyone's trying to do what's best for themselves. You know, some may have better motives than others. Um, but the picture that's been painted here is that this is a land where evil reigns. And the vulnerable are not protected. If the vulnerable aren't protected, it's kind of meaning that evil reigns. And, and the book of Judges is showing us, hey, this, this is what happens when people abandon their love for God and their love for their neighbour. They're kind of connected. But the story doesn't end here. See, for, for Israel, the fruit of this episode ends in a massive civil war. The Levite kind of shares his outrage at what's, what's happened to his girlfriend. He um, tells all the tribes, <coughs> um, and they come together. They're absolutely disgusted, so they come together against the tribe of Benjamin, and Benjamin says, hey, we're not selling out our village, so they go to war against each other. And ultimately, we find the near elimination of the tribe of Benjamin and actually a bunch of, a lot of death going on. And at the end, there's, there's a lot of self-righteous justification for the tribes who went to war. But the sad truth is actually right through this whole ep episode, no one looks like a hero. You know the old saying, no one, no one wins a war? Yeah, no one looks like a hero in, in, in a war like this either. Um, and at the beginning, at the end, I should say, of this final book of Judges, it's really fitting that we're left with this last line. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. This is the fruit of that. So what do we take from that? I mean, it's brutal and it's pretty depressing, isn't it? Um, and the people who should be bringing the positive influence, the Levites, are just as bad as everyone else. So one of the first questions this story raises is where is God in all of this? You know, um, why has he gone silent in this time? Or has he gone silent? You know, what if the civil war that Israel found themselves in was actually the judgment on God, of God on all of them? Um, 
interesting, if we go a, a more recent civil war, maybe 200 years ago, um, the American Civil War, um, there's a fellow, a fellow who was president at that time, remember his name? Abraham Lincoln, that's right. Um, he described this war, this is interesting, he described this civil war as God's judgment against America altogether. Not north and south, he said, it's, this is God's judgment on all of us. Um, and he, he, he said, it's really important we understand that this doesn't mean one side's right and the other's wrong. Um, he says it's quite possible God's purpose is different from the purposes of either party here. You know, we've got our plans, but actually God's, God's actually bringing what he, um, his about. And funnily enough, not everyone in the north appreciated this. Um, they thought they were in the right. But when questioned, Lincoln said this. He said, men aren't flattered by showing there's a difference of purpose between the almighty and them. <laughs> now, we don't like it when God says we're wrong. But that doesn't make your behavior right. Uh, and keep in mind, when Lincoln's saying this, he's saying this to these, a nation that's Christian. And this is a similar kind of, um, as to what actually happened for, judge, for the judges. This is a brutal story of a nation over 400 years who slowly lost their sight of God. They were still religious, but they believed that they could live their life on their own terms. They could worship God in their own ways. And ultimately, this belief came at a great cost to everyone. Because as they moved away from obedience to God, they inevitably began to turn on one another. And as I said, hey, that speaks to us today, doesn't it? You know, we live in a world where we see this happening. I think on a mega scale with, um, with nations at war, but actually even in communities, even in some of their families, we see some of this stuff playing out. And the thing is that can cause us to grieve. Do you know that? Have you felt that before? So, and that's quite natural. I mean, yes, as we see behaviours that break the heart of God. But it's a time, in, in times like this, it's really, really important for us that we don't lose sight of the hope that we have. That we don't lose sight of the hope that we have. Because the Bible tells us, then despite of, in spite of all of these things, judgment isn't always inevitable. Instead, it's the heart of God to see everybody saved. Um, 2 Peter 3.9 tells us this. It says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some of you understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you. He's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Everyone. What does that mean? Does that mean everyone who thinks like us? Who thinks that we're on God's side? No. It means Everybody. God's willing that no one should perish, but that all should come to repentance, to change their minds and follow him. And so the Bible says, if this is to happen, it is going to take time. And God will make it take time because he's patient and he's slow to anger. In fact, in um, that second chapter in 2 Peter 3, if we move down to verse 15, um, it, um, Peter goes on to say, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. God has a plan. It might not work at a speed we understand, but it's his plan. So how does that affect us? Well, I think, first of all, um, as Christians, we need to recognise living in a world that's rebellious to God and his purposes, from time to time, for each of us, there's going to be a legit legitimate place for mourning. Mourning is sadness, grief. Um, you know, it's often said about Jesus' kingdom that it's now and not yet. You know, sometimes we see glimpses of it. Have you been there and seen something where God's been there and you're, Whoa, and then you've, the next day you've seen something and it's like, oh, why has that happened? You know, as if the promise has slipped through our fingers. Um, w when we're in that, those spaces, there will be times when we mourn because we find ourselves carrying an, an, a burden for an aspect of God's kingdom that we don't see happening right now. You know, that might be seeing someone die before their time. It might be watching a loved one make a decision we know is not a good one. You know, things do not always go as we think they ought to. There's a grief that comes with that. And carrying that grief can be a heavy burden. But it's important that we learn to bring these griefs before God and not kind of fall victim to despair. Uh, much like Jesus did. Um, when Jesus was praying over Jerusalem, do you remember he, um, he re this was before he went to the cross, he's praying over Jerusalem and he's realising that they are not going to come to him for, for salvation. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, who, who have been sent to you. How often I've longed to gather your children together as hens gather their chicks under their wings and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Jesus here is mourning over Jerusalem. 
He's weeping over Jerusalem. But here's the thing, while he was sad, he didn't let that sadness turn to anger and disappointment with God, which sometimes we can do, it's been there, or, to, or frustration against the people of Jerusalem. He doesn't do that either. Instead, Jesus turns to hope. If you go to Luke 13, 35, Jesus goes on to say, I tell you, Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, Jesus looks to the future. He looks to eternity and he trusts in God's plan. He trusts that God's going to bring about his plan, even if it means short-term suffering. And in the same way, while there may be times of mourning for us, Jesus calls us to be a people whose eyes and our actions are fixed firmly on the hope that we have in Jesus. And if we go back to that passage in 2 Peter 3, um, verse 13 and 14, about how God is slow to keep his, um, about God being slow to keep his promise. This is the message. It says, hey, remember, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. This is saying, hey, don't hang up your head um, in despair. Don't give up. You know, yes, offer your prayers of mourning to God, but also continue to pray for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven and to reach out towards and to live for the promised future that God's calling us to live for. Don't give up. A while ago, um, it kind of reminds me of a little story I heard a while ago, um, a little bit about a donkey that fell in a deep hole in the road. And I'm like one of those holes you get on as you drive to Snell's Beach. Those fellas who live out, you know what it's like. Anyway, this donkey's kind of stuck in a hole, and as you know, donkeys don't have arms or legs or anything. Oh, they've got legs, no arms. Um, and and they go, okay, what am I going to do here? And, and starts kind of scratching at the wall. Um, and just the dirt and stuff starts falling all over its head. And, and, and every time it starts to kind of accumulate, it shakes it off, stomps it down, stomps down. And I mean, they're not super smart, so they think, oh, well, I'll just keep going. Um, and it does this time for one, you know, two, three, four, five, keeps just doing this for a while. And after a while, the donkey starts to realize, hang on a sec, I can actually see out of this hole now. It's been pouring away. Um, and so he goes back to work anyway, just scratching at the wall, trying to climb, but obviously not climbing anywhere. Um, the dirt's falling on it, shaking the dirt, stomping it down. And until, of course, the donkey gets to the height where he can actually get out the hole and walk free. Um, it just kept at it, kept on going. It kept looking up, thinking, that's where I want to be. Um, and I, th I guess the point in that story is that sometimes in the pursuit of God, we can find ourselves in places where we actually don't really see a solution. We don't really figure, how are we going to get out of this? We don't know. Um, we're, we're in a place where we don't see God's kingdom operating on earth like it should be in heaven. And yeah, it's okay to mourn these things and bring, bring them before God. But Jesus says, hey, don't stay in that place of disappointment and frustration. Jesus says, hey, look to me. Trust me. Um, shake it off. Stamp it down, take the next step. Once again, shake it off, stamp it down, take the next step. And we just keep doing that. And as we do, we patiently wait for God to do what he does in his time. And we trust him to bring about the results. And eventually, before you know it, think, oh, this hole wasn't as big as I thought it used to be. Uh, we trust God and wait for him to bring about his salvation. Because God's patience brings salvation. Apostle Paul puts it this way. In um, Colossians 1.23, he says, Continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move out from the hope held in the gospel. So that's what following Jesus looks like. See, the devil's goal is for us to live in discouragement. Because when we're living in discouragement, we don't kind of look for the opportunities that God's bringing. But God commands us, what does he say? He said, do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. He says, I love you. I'm with you, and you can trust my love. And just as a side note, often you find when God does move, it often happens a lot more than, a lot quicker than you're prepared for. Um, now, in a couple of weeks, when I get, I'm actually not here next week. Um, Hugo's going to take ch take charge. Um, I'm doing a little bit of a camper van trip, but I'll be back after that. And when I do come back, I, I want to tie up this uh, this series um, by actually looking at two characters I haven't touched on in Judges the outliers and how God can use one person to make a dramatic to make dramatic changes um, which is um, but, and, and not because they, these, these two people in particular they weren't super powerful they weren't warriors or anything like that they were just people who were willing to listen to God and trust him 
And I, so I thought that's a great way to kind of wind up the series because I think that's probably the most relatable for all of us. I don't know how many Warriors are in here. Probably not any more Warriors fans. No, no. <laughs> oh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't let that go. But, um, I, I, but, that, but so, that, so that's where we're going to be heading. But before we do this morning, um, let's just close with some prayer, right? Father God, it can be really difficult living in a broken world. I think most of us know that. Um, deep inside, Lord, however, we, we kind of know how things ought to go. And it's really hard when things don't kind of operate how we think they ought to. But Father, sometimes if we've been completely honest, some of the worst failures are the ones that we do. Um, even if nobody else knows about them, and we do. And yet you hold out your hand to us, Father. You call us and draw us into you. You say that you don't want us to miss the mark and, and you want everyone to be saved and to live for the, to the potential that you made us for. So Father, with all of that, we come before you this morning and all of our brokenness and with all the brokenness of this world that we live in and we ask first and foremost, Jesus, have mercy on us. And it will help us not to be led by discouragement or frustration with others, but actually help us to turn our eyes to you. And, and, and the, the, Jesus, the, the fixer and the perfecter, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who can fix us. Lord, we look to you and we surrender our life to yours. And Father, we also continue to pray for our nation that you continue to pour your mercy out on this land, just like the rain is pouring out now, that the people's hearts would be open to the gospel and receptive to your Holy Spirit, calling them to Jesus. Father, we pray that you would make a way where there seems to be no way. In our, in our households, and with our loved ones, with the people that we work amongst, um, with our wider community groups, with our community, with our, with our nation. And Lord, that you would use us to draw people to you and your love. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.